Hi guys, thank you so much for watching Empower In. So in this video, we're going to go over the nurse's role in sepsis. If you haven't already seen, I do have a video going over sepsis where I give a very general overview of what sepsis is. In this video, we're gonna actually take it one step further and we're gonna go over what the nurse's role is and how we can identify sepsis very early. The information that I use from this video is from the website Surviving Sepsis Campaign. I will place a link below to their website. It's pretty much the industry standard, so if you have any questions or need clarification, make sure you definitely visit that website. So let's get started and let's go over the nurse's role in sepsis. The first step for the nurse is recognizing patients that are at risk for sepsis. The following groups are at increased risk and should be watched carefully. Patients that are very ill due to an infectious agent, patients in intensive care units, patients with weakened or compromised immune systems, patients with devices such as IV catheters, breathing tubes, or other devices, patients with extensive burns. Bringing it to the nurse's bedside assessment. So when you are with your patients, no matter what they are admitted for, ask yourself if they have a potential source of infection. For example, one time I had a patient that was admitted for chest pain, but he had a draining wound on his leg. Definitely a source of infection. Other potential sources of infection could include surgical sites. Look at the site. Is the site red, swollen? Is there drainage? Does it have odor? What color is the drainage? Does it have pus? Respiratory infections are also consideration. Does your patient have a cough, wheezes, difficulty breathing, or are they lethargic, which is a very late sign of inadequate oxygenation? Do they have a central line, especially a femoral access, which carry a huge risk of infection? Are their white blood cell counts elevated or very low, greater than 12,000 or less than 4,000? Do they have any tubes or drains? For example, Foley catheter, feeding tube, JP drain. Any foreign devices can always be a potential source of infection. Has your patient traveled to another country recently? There could be possible exposure to different organisms in less desirable sanitary conditions. Is your patient here for a known infection? For example, cellulitis, hepatitis, diverticulitis, or any other infection that could have potentially spread to other organs or the bloodstream. Your assessment. General signs and symptoms may include the following. Fever with or without shaking chills. Sometimes I have even noticed that my patients will start shaking before they actually have a fever. When I see them shaking, I will start to check their temperature more frequently. So now let's look at the assessment system by system. Neurologically, is your patient alert and oriented? Times four. Person, place, time, and situation. Or are they at their baseline or appropriate for age? Or are they lethargic and you cannot orient them? Respiratory. Are they breathing normally? Is their oxygen saturation greater than 94%? Do they look comfortable? Do they have wheezes, crackles, labor breathing, an oxygen saturation that is less than 94%. Do they have an increased breathing rate greater than 20 respirations per minute? In sepsis, this is due to respiratory alkalosis. Cardiovascular. When you auscultate or listen to the heart, does it sound normal? When you check the upper and lower extremities, are they warm or cold to touch? How is the capillary refill? How is their blood pressure? Is it less than 90 systolic? How is their pulse? Is it greater than 90 beats per minute? Keep Keep in mind medications that the patient is taking. If they are on a beta blocker like metoprolol or calcium channel blocker like cardizem, these medications can potentially hide the signs and symptoms of the elevated pulse. Are they on a vasopressor, which can mask hypotension? Now let's look at the gastrointestinal system. Is their abdomen normal on inspection and auscultation? Or do they have diminished bowel sounds, pain on palpation, and infrequent bowel movements? The renal system. Are they are they urinating normally without any pain or frequency, with at least 0.5 milliliters per kilogram per hour? Also, is there creatinine within normal limits? We will go further into this in a bit. Skin. Is their skin warm, dry, and intact? Or do they have injuries, punctures, burns, surgical sites, tubes? Recognizing the early signs by screening for SEERS. SEERS stands for Systemic Inflammatory Response Syndrome. Clinically, the patient needs to fit in at least two of the Sears criteria and have a suspected or proven infection. Most hospitals are instituting tools to help screen for sepsis. These screening tools must be utilized and documentation must be completed every shift. 
At my hospital, I work for HCA, we have a two-tier system. As we go over and learn about these tiers, keep in mind to always look at the patient's trends. What we're really looking for is changes within the last 48 hours, acute onset basically. So whenever you see a laboratory result that is abnormal, look to see if the patient has been that way. Have they been that way for a week or two weeks? Or did this happen within the last 48 hours and has it been steadily decreasing or rising? The initial tier is based off the patient's vital signs and white blood cell count. It checks for a temperature that is greater than 38.3 degrees Celsius or less than 36 degrees Celsius. It checks for a heart rate if the patient's heart rate is greater than 90 beats per minute, followed by the respiratory rate, which is supposed to be less than 20. Then it looks at the white blood cell count. Are the white blood cells greater than 12,000 or less than 4,000? Or is the white blood cell count normal? However, there are presence of bands. Bands are the immature forms of the white blood cells. Since they are immature, they are not detected on the CBC as white blood cells. However, this is the earliest sign of a white blood cell response. If there is greater than 10% bands, this is concerning. If two out of these four flag positive, then we are directed to go to the second tier. Note that in most facilities, anyone can place vital signs into the systems, for example, another nurse or a nursing assistant. They can do this either manually or electronically. And I, as a nurse, will get some sort of notification, either in the computer system or the charge nurse will get an alert on a beeper or phone. The initial notification means to potentially reassess. For example, the other day I had a patient, a male who was 31 years old. However, he was autistic. And when the nursing assistant took his vital signs, his pulse was 105 and his respirations were 22. All of his other labs were normal. When I went in to assess him, he was skipping around and flapping his arms around. After we convinced him to sit down and eat a snack, we rechecked his vital signs and they were within normal limits. So sometimes the initial flag simply means to reassess. However, when you have verified the validity of the vital signs and or white blood cells in tier one and two of them are positive, you are required to investigate further to check for signs of organ dysfunction. You must assess your patient's hemodynamic status. Is the systolic blood pressure less than 90 or the MAP less than 70? Or was there a decrease of 40 millimeters of mercury from baseline? You must also complete a neuro assessment, which can be started by simply observing the patient for alertness and also asking questions to gauge your patient's orientation. Keep in mind the patient's baseline. Next, look for arterial hypoxia, which could be a PaO2 or FiO2 less than 300. I know on the med search and teleunits, you will not always have this information, but you can use your nursing judgment. Do they have worsening oxygen saturation, even with oxygen via nasal cannula? Then we check the kidneys. Has there been a urine output less than 0.5 milliliters per kilogram per hour, despite fluid administration? Or was there a creatinine increase of 0.5 from baseline? Next is the coagulation abnormalities. Is your patient's INR greater than 1.5 or PTT greater than 60? seconds and they are not receiving the medication Coumadin. Now we go to the platelets. Are the platelets less than 100,000? Normal starts at 150,000. Now we check the liver. We're checking for the bilirubin. Is the serum bilirubin greater than four? In this section, if even one is positive, you must take it to the next step, which may mean calling the charge nurse, the sepsis coordinator, a rapid response, or code sepsis, whichever is indicated by your facility. Definitive diagnosis depends on positive blood culture for the infectious agent, and at least two of the serious criteria. Severe sepsis is a diagnosis when the septic patient has organ dysfunction. For example, low or no urine output, altered mental status. Severe sepsis can also include sepsis-induced hypotension, which is also termed septic shock, which is when the patient's blood pressure falls to dangerously low levels. Treatment. The Surviving Sepsis Campaign has developed bundles to improve outcomes for patients that may be determined to have severe sepsis. This campaign was last updated in 2012 and is widely recognized as the industry standard for providing best practice and recommendations for early detection and treatment options. They also include three to six hour bundles. If you would like to see a video going over the treatment bundles, then please do me a favor and give this video a thumbs up and I will see if I can do that. Also, make sure you visit their website, the link is below, to always have access to the latest evidence-based information. All right guys, I really hope this helped a pretty complicated subject matter get a little bit clearer. Just remember
remember that you are never alone in the hospital or any facility for that matter. If you ever have any questions or concerns, do not hesitate to ask another nurse, your charge nurse, your director. Believe me, you are never alone. And if you are ever worried about your patient, do not hesitate to call for help in the form of a medical response team, a rapid response, a code, whatever your facility calls it. I call codes all the time and trust me, I have learned that a little blow to my ego for being wrong is well worth that one time being right and saving a life. So just call the code if you need it. <laughs> Also, I would like to thank Golden Valley Memorial Hospital in Clinton, Missouri for this video request and sponsorship. If you live in that area, they're actually hiring new graduates and experienced nurses, and I will place a link to their website below. I also asked them if they had a few things that they would like to share, and they said that the nurses at their facility are very proud to have bedside reporting and documentation every shift on the whiteboard, which helps the nurse to patient communication and also helps the patient stay up to date with their plan of care too. All right guys, thanks so much again for watching, and. I hope to see you very soon. I love you. Bye.